today, we've got Biker Jim talking about the movie The Menu. We had the DNC, mm -hmm. and the Democratic National Convention was in Colorado in 2007. Been in business a couple of years. You know, I met 50,000 50, new friends that week. Wow. You know, made enough money that week to buy a second hot dog cart. And so I bought a second cart, opened up at like 17th in California for about three months and then managed to nab a spot on Auraria campus. And so we moved the cart to Auraria campus and had been there ever since. Uh, it's, you know, I think we've fed at least three full generations from freshman through senior. Mm, that's a lot of dropouts. That's a lot of dropouts. <laughs> no, these are not the dropouts. The dropouts, tons more. Tons more. Well, many of them work for me. I was going to say, they're like, you hired? <laughs> Almost all the time. Yeah, that's awesome. So, you know, it's, it's pretty fun that we're actually doing food and film, you know, mm -hmm. uh, because... I've pretty much learned how to cook by watching TV. Mm. Uh, I've learned how to cook through cookbooks. I don't have any real particular you know, formal culinary training, but I read a lot of cookbooks mm. and I watched a lot of uh, a lot of food shows. You know? mm. I mean, some of the early stuff, man. You know, Graham Kerr, the Galloping Gourmet. Mm. You guys probably haven't seen him, but you know, he used to. You know, British man, and he'd come out and he cook a meal, have a little studio audience, and ultimately just get wasted, you know? It's like, you know, we glug a little in the sauce, and we glug a little in the glass, and by the end of the show, he's like, you know, really pretty high, and he's running out to the audience, dragging some unwilling woman up on stage to try the stuff, you know? No, no, come with me, you know? Um, just fun, and you know, and I'd, I'd watch this, and I'd go, huh, I can make a souffle, you know? Um, you know, steak and kidney pie? Shit, yeah, you know, let's do that. Uh, I, I always wanted to kind of push my culinary boundaries mm. when it came to that, try something new that I'd never made before, and I can follow directions. And then once you kind of know the mechanics of something, then you can vamp a little bit, mm -hmm. you know, do some fun stuff. But, you know, so that week, what's that? I made enough money to buy a second hot dog cart, mm. started expanding the business a little bit. You know, and the timing couldn't have been better because I was getting fried. I'm working as much as I could, and I there was no way I was going to make any more money than I was making. I couldn't possibly work any harder, and I just felt like I was spinning my wheels and starting to get into a rut. Um, I read a book called The E-Myth Revisited, and The E-Myth is basically the entrepreneurial myth. And at the time, it couldn't have been better. A friend of mine recommended that to me. I read it. Once again, you know, opportunities presenting themselves from who knows where. Yeah. Um, but I read that and just kind of, without even thinking about it, I just started moving in a direction of expansion mm. and bought a second cart. You know, managed to put my first employee to work. We took over this concession stand that was on the 16th Street Mall right behind my cart, uh, Biker Jim's Freakishly Small Concession Stand. Mm. You know, had my second employee. You know, weird hiring people and you know doing payroll and that kind of stuff. Um, being responsible for, you know, the usual herding of cats that mm -hmm. having people working with you can be. And it just little by little grew. I heard something one day on a street corner just, you know, was a revelation. Somebody says, yeah, I think we're going to go get some biker gyms. I went, not getting hot dogs from biker gyms, but they're getting biker gyms. All of a sudden, I was a brand, you know, from that day on. So weird. What year was that? That would have been, you know, right around 2007, 2008. You wow. know, I've been doing this maybe two to three years. So that's like post-DNC? Right? <laughs> post? Um, right, roughly right around the yeah. same time. I, I can't tell you exactly when. It might have been, yeah, yeah probably. What was the weather like? You know? <laughs> <laughs> probably it, it was after, a Sunday. Probably after Sunday. the Definitely. DNC. Definitely like, Sunday. Yeah. yeah. Um, and... That was I said, that that was a revelation. So I was able to kind of start seeing the business from a different direction. Mm. Probably shortly after I read the e myth, truthfully. I don't know. I said somebody said one time, you know, if you set a goal and you know how to go about doing it, yeah. it's time to set a different goal. Mm. And because avenues arrive 
possibly unexpected. But, you know, I'm already thinking this direction. How I get there, I'm not positive exactly how I'm going to get there, but I'm going to get there. And every time I've set a goal, I've been able to achieve that goal. It's just sometimes it happens in ways that I don't expect. Very um, Nietzsche. Very yeah. Nietzsche. You've got the why, yo. Know, yeah, just don't need get to the how. how. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know? I mean, sometimes things are really weird. I, you know, how that works out. We had, I had a general manager at the restaurant working for me. This guy turned out to be a thief. And he was stealing money from us. Mm-hmm. Little by little. You know, 100 bucks here, 200 bucks there, you know. And when we finally realized it, you know, it was greater than 20 grand, you know, that this guy had stolen from us. And so we didn't have very much money. And we got an insurance check, you know, because we have business loss insurance. And I got paid back that 20, you know, got paid back like 21 grand. Wow. You know, all in one lump. And that made X available for us. You know, we were able to buy a piece of equipment that we couldn't have had before. You know, we were able to get through the winter that was, you know, winters are really tough for us sometimes. So um, this being our first show, we, we might as well use this opportunity to test uh, our beep, our, you know, beeping things out. So what was that guy's name? That guy's name was So that was beeped out. It worked again. <laughs> wow. AI. That's how, that's how you censor stuff, folks. AI, ladies and gentlemen. Hmm. All right. So is my language censored? No, I mean, just not, that name. You know, I mean, so I can use profanity. Because oh, yes. I don't like to because profanity is the last avenue of the inarticulate mm. motherfucker. I always felt, you know, it's like just a little pet. That was a smart joke. Fuck, 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 fuck. I always like George Carlin's <laughs> seven words you can't say on TV. I like the seven <laughs> words you can say that just wish you wouldn't. Uvula, <laughs> <laughs> masticate, you know, things Ooh, like that. Speaking of masticate, what year was it that, did, that uh, you had a picture with Anthony Bourdain? Sorry, that didn't mean that. Yeah, that was masculine. We, were, we masticated together. Yes. It was <laughs> circle masticating. Um, oh. That way, he came by the cart in uh, 20, 2009. Ah. So we shot from the cart uh, uh, an episode in No Reservations with this guy. And it was pretty fun because the, uh, you know, the week before, everybody knew he was coming. You know, mm-hmm. he does a speaking engagement along with or did a speaking engagement along with his show that he'd shot. So, you know, he was doing a show at the um, DCPA, Denver Center for Performing Arts, and you'd pay rock star prices to go see him on stage, you know, talk for an hour. Um, So everybody knew he was coming because the show was scheduled, and everybody's asking in the newspaper, where should he go eat? You know, he should go here, he should go here. And I got a phone call from the... uh, producer of the show, you know, saying, yeah, Anthony or Tony had heard about you and was wondering if you'd be interested in being on his show. And I'm like, yes, please. Yes, that would be nice. You know, thank you very much. And she just begged me not to tell anybody that he was coming. So I only told a handful of people that he was coming. Uh, And we shot, you know, the crew showed up maybe two hours before he did, two and a half hours, shot B-roll, so we're shooting for him. And then he comes walking up the street. Yeah. You know, my balls are in my throat. You know, we're talking to Anthony Bourdain, for God's sakes. You know, and he comes up and, you know, says, it smells good here. And I start blathering on about, you know, hormone-free, antibiotic-free, all this ethically sourced bullshit. And he goes, who cares? It's meat in a tube. And I said, yeah, but look, we're like 20 miles from Boulder. You know, there's there's these concessions yeah. we need to make. And he goes, oh, I get it. You know, that sort of broke the ice. And we had a, you know, we had a fun time talking. That's awesome. You know? There's a place in Chicago called Hot Dugs. Hot Dugs was the darling of the gourmet hot dog world. Had been for a little while. And Bourdain had been there, you know, and he named it one of his top ten favorite places in the country to eat. I had been there, and when I went there, uh, Doug had, you know, he does his celebrity sausage of the day. The day that I went there was the biker gym dog. And, you know, I told that to Bourdain, and Bourdain goes, you had a fucking celebrity sausage. I didn't get a fucking celebrity sausage of the day. You know, so we kind of hit it off in that regard. He came back to Denver, I think it was in 2017, was doing a tour for his cookbook, um, Appetites. Hmm. And uh, he asked if we would cater his after party or his VIP party. 
and sure we would, you know, went in and catered the party. Uh, Ruth Babette's Bakery, um, they used to be in the source, they're now up in Longmont. Yeah. You know, just amazing French style baked, baked foods. Those guys real baguettes, great. real the croissants. Baguettes, the croissants, yes. I just went up there for a croissant date the day before yesterday. Delicious, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, and I got a chance to hang out with him. His VIP party was basically, it was, it was beautiful. He, you know, charged people an extra $125 to sit in line for an hour and get a picture with him. And he'd sign the book, you know, or he'd sign half a dozen books for you if you wanted, you know. Um, but the thing that I learned about him that day and why the producer asked me not to tell anyone, because the guy dug his fans, man. You know, I mean, he could tell the story, but he knew that if it wasn't for people like you and me, he'd be standing next to a deep fryer. Mm. So if anybody wanted a picture with him, yeah, sure, you know, he'd stop what he was doing, take a picture or yeah. sign anything. So that was just, you know, there's this appreciation for his fans. There's appreciation for people that cook, you know. I mean, he went to the $5 lunch. And then, you know, and, and, and loved it, ate like five hot dogs, you know. All these restaurants around the hotel that he was staying at, you know, they all made their best food and they, you know, and they had their best chefs send it over. And it was like that scene from the second Matrix where, you know, Neo goes walking to his little cave room and there's all this food lined up <laughs> for him down the hall. It was like that. And he couldn't eat any of it because he just ate like five hot dogs, <laughs> you know. The, the, the bellmen were coming up to me the next day going, oh, man, I had the best salmon prosciutto last night. Thank you. You know, because he couldn't eat it. He just gave it away, you know. But yeah, that was that was that was why we would watch him tell the same story, or at least tell a story, every week, you know, for a decade or twelve years. The guy was authentic, you know, and yeah. could tell the story. So it just really resonates with people. I think like when we were talking about this film, the menu, mm -hmm. you know, like there's this portion of inauthenticity. I think. You know, that chef, he's fighting against that, too, you know. And then I was curious what your thoughts were being in the restaurant industry. Oh, I, I, I mean, I love the movie. And, you know, at the end, I was sort of surprised. And then when I thought about it, I wasn't surprised. But um, uh, Will Ferrell is one of the producers of that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so I'm going, oh, I get it. Because yeah. it's such beautiful, great satire. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, every trope, every kind of restaurant person trope was in there. You got your celebrity that kind of needs to be seen and and be doing the uh, you know the the cutting edge thing you know you absolutely got the chef that's you know basing that place on Alan A and L E and you know all these restaurant tropes that are impossible to get into and mega expensive and um, very experimental you know with what they're doing with their food and so because it's so avant garde of course people want to experience it. You got your, uh, your your hedge fund boys that yeah. you know are there. Up and coming money makers. Yeah, yeah, you know, and it's just they don't care. They're just you know, if it if it costs fifteen hundred dollars, that's where they need to be. You know, the American Psycho bunch. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Wow, well, that was cheap. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Um, you know, you've got your food writers. You know, I mean, I just I I loved how they took, you know, the persona. The, those personas and put them all in one room, mm -hmm. you know, and then, you know, kind of turned that whole thing on the ear. This yeah. is a surprise, you know. It was listed as a horror, mm -hmm. you know. It was a comedy, I, I think, from start to finish. Yeah. I definitely yeah. thought, like, that dark comedy. Satire. Too, yeah. you know, I, I love the digs, right? <laughs> yeah. Because it, the digs. I, working in the restaurant industry for decades, you dig at each other. I mean, whether there's a bus boy or a bartender or two waitresses what have you you have these little slight days <laughs> you having a good day you know <laughs> so yeah, it, yeah that movie really really had that and my favorite dig is at the end and i'll let you guys talk about that later on right but your favorite scene from that sh uh, uh that movie um i want to get into that you know let's let's talk about that well, i have several favorites but you know uh, uh, i always first off i love Absolute silence happens there. Everybody's attention is drawn to that. But, you know, my 
my favorite scene is when the underdog kind of calls out the, uh, you know, the overlord, so to speak, and just goes, you know, your food sucks. I'm, I, you know, I don't like any of it. You know, and the uh, and the real tragedy is I'm still hungry. You know, that scene right there. You know, it reminded me. Did you see Chef? I did. Yeah. You know, yeah. and that scene where. What's Joan's last name? Favreau. John Favreau, you know, is a chef. And he goes into the restaurant because the food critic is there again. And, you know, because he got forced to, you know, not do his avant-garde menu, do something that he had, was passionate about. You know, the guy just totally trashed him, you know, didn't understand social media. So he called him out and then just got lambasted and basically, you know, quit over this thing. But when he went in to just rail against the food critic, mm. you know? I I couldn't help but stand up in the middle of the theater and start <laughs> clapping. It's like, you know, you are someone that doesn't know what we go through to do this, mm. you know? Um, your whole life just is, you know, only a little bit, you know? It, it doesn't quite understand the rest of what's going on. People do, as a business owner, fuck, man, when, when it was just me on a hot dog cart, yeah. You know, fuck you. No hot dogs for you. I could be the hot dog. Nazi. You know, yeah, yeah. now I have crew that I have to consider. You know, yeah, yeah. now I have. You know, so you're the opposite of that character, Ray Fiennes, yeah. right? He was all. That's all him. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I'll make you the best cheeseburger you ever had. That scene was fantastic. I mean, she touched on such a nerve for him because you know he knew. You know, he'd been doing this long enough and where his passion was had just, you know, yeah. been pulled away layer by layer by layer, you know, to where there's nothing left. Yeah. You know, there was no passion in what he was doing, you know. He's just doing something because he feels he has to. Yeah. You know, it's not something that he wants to do, you know. And, and she'd actually been able to, you know, kind of get to the root of where he was at. You know, and so that moment when she just says, you know, I want a cheeseburger. I mean, and granted, she had inside knowledge and knew exactly what she was talking about. Yeah, yeah. But you just saw the change in him. He went from, you know, ice cold, just a shell. You just saw that shell break a little bit, you know, and you saw a little heat, you know, a little flush of blood go into it. I mean, Ralph Fiennes was amazing in that scene. You know, and then he goes and he makes the perfect cheeseburger. You know, it just, you know, I, I want one right now just thinking about that scene. The cheeseburger that your parents can barely afford. Yeah. <laughs> what a lie, yeah. man. You know, but you think back to when, you know, kind of, I mean, I like, I'll, I'll, I'll eat a bougie fucking cheeseburger, man. <laughs> you know, I mean, they can be really good, you know, where you're sourcing your food and all that kind of stuff. But back in the day when a cheeseburger, just a simple cheeseburger, was made with fresh ground beef. And you know, I am old, you know. I remember those days, you know. There weren't the processed hockey pucks of hamburgers that get passed out all over the place. There was, you know, back when food was food, back when an apple tasted like an apple. You know, I remember all that. Um, so, yeah, that scene, you know. That was probably some of the best food porn in that movie. You know, and you think about it. I mean, the whole yeah. movie was based on food porn. Yeah. You know, um, that scene right there was, you know, the most appetizing part of the movie. Yeah. You, know? you think there's like this this disconnect? Like there was the stomach and the intellectualism. You know, mm -hmm. throughout the movie, the stomach and the brain, and then that moment's like the stomach and the heart almost. You're like, ooh, that's the soul. I think you. I think yeah. you just nailed it right there, yeah. man. You know. Um, yeah, we eat with our eyes, you know, and some of what he was putting out there, you know, absolutely beautiful mm -hmm. and enticing. But does that hit the heart at all, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and much less the stomach? No, you're, you're eating it because, first off, it's an experience. And I love experience, man. I would, I would be all over that menu for the experience. Mm -hmm. Would I want, walk out there and want a cheeseburger? Yeah, maybe. You know, I almost always feel that way after I eat sushi. Sushi is <laughs> amazing, good food, you know, beautiful, tastes amazing. Does it fill my stomach? Does it fill that part of me that really wants to get filled? 
you know, that lonely spot inside of me that nothing yeah. can quite fill <laughs> except maybe food, food or food. love. <laughs> you know, um, but then you look at that cheeseburger and what went into that that didn't go into any, any of the other food. You know, love went into that food. You know, love went into that burger. And that's, I think, what people crave, you know, that passion. You know, so, yeah. I, that you brought that up earlier about like being authentic too. Um, do you feel like in your food, like you bring this authenticity every time, like where even if it's not at your restaurant, or like you talk about being a brand, you're like, ooh, you get by your dreams. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, absolutely. I think, you know, um, yeah, maybe my fingers don't touch everything. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Probably a good idea because my fingers touch everything else. Um, but there's still that kind of passion that goes into what we make you know it started that way I mean you know I bought I started the hot dog business so I didn't have to sit in a truck all day you know I've only had one death threat as a hot dog guy and that guy was crazy you know so I I felt like I pushed my luck about as far as I needed to you know as a repo man so but it developed into such a passion project you know it developed into you know but see I, you know I I kind of always had a love affair with people. You know, I like people. I'm, I'm an extroverted hermit. You know, I mean, I can suck off out of my own little world pretty well. But I like people. I like to interact. I like that experience. And feeding people is an important part of that experience for me. I found that's a good avenue for me to do it. Um, so, yeah, is that passion still in the food that we cook? Absolutely. You know, I've got a good crew. I've got people that, you know, kind of feel that way and we're, we're not just cooking food you know I, mean, I, I think it's the fact that we're all part of the same team again comes in you know um so yeah thank you for bringing that up you know, give me a chance to well and the people love you you know one thing about um uh, jim is he gets out there people know him uh, he's engaged you know the community uh it's the whole state of aurora right we um um we went to someone's house, uh, Jim and I, uh, to pick up a gimbal. And I, I mean, I want to make it kind of like, uh, hey, um, well, you know, this is back to Jim, like kind of thing. I mean, that, that, yeah, it's just me trying to drop a name in front of him. <laughs> um, and this guy who, we, we, he's like, oh, yeah, he's like, he knows. And man, he had this, he, he changed his face, he dropped his shoulders, right? He was, he was, he was ready to, to shake your hand. I was right there. It was, it was a great feeling. And, um, you know, so what's next? I mean, you've talked about all these cookbooks that you've read. Let's, let's talk about it. I, I'm, I've been dying to ask, Art, will you have a cookbook? I mean, I, I buy it. Well, so if, you're, hope if, you're you buying, it. if you're buying it, I'm making one. But, you know. I'm a dog dude, too, so I gotta learn. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I will, as a matter of fact. I've, you know, I, I have a number of books in me. You know, but a cookbook is probably the thing that makes the most sense. Mm-hmm. You know, I went to school to write, you know to get a degree in journalism at CU. That's what brought me to Colorado. But I've never worked in that field since I got here. I worked in TV before mm-hmm. I came down here, but I never got in front of the camera until I started the food biz. So, yes, a cookbook is absolutely in the works. I, It's going to cover a lot of the stuff that I love. And I also have a particular voice that I think needs to be heard. You know, especially when I write, <laughs> I don't take things too seriously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, and there, there's, you know, so many cookbooks out there, and I've, I've read through so many. I said I'm a cookbook chef. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'd like to take some of my takes on what I've learned how to cook, and bring them to people, but also bring it to you in such a way that you, know, you go, "What's that fucking guy talking about?" <laughs> you know, just but accessible. Um and easy, you know. I'm not. I'm not a complicated chef. Yeah. I mean, I'm not to say it, but you know, this this humble facade, not a facade. He's humble. Uh, he, it's uh, uh, someone that's cooked at the James Beard House, right? I mean, you've got students going to culinary school. That is one of their bucket list. That was a good day at the office, you know. So, so yeah, I mean, several years ago, I worked with a number of chefs all year um, called the Colorado Five, 
you know, with Lee Sullivan, she put this, put on this group and every year she would get five different chefs put it on. You do a series of events at each of chef's perspective restaurants. You'd wear leotards. And you know, <laughs> we'd all wear leotards and, 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 um, you know, aprons. You know, <laughs> we look pretty tight. Um, you know, and we, we would do things like, you know, cook it, the Aston Food and Wine Classic or uh, Breckenridge Wine Festival, you know, Crested Butte. We'd, and ultimately culminate with cooking at the James Beard House. So, I mean, every year or every event, the dish that I served would be Biker Jim's famous chicken fried steak. It was never chicken fried steak. That was just the name of my dish. Yeah. And um, when I finally got to the Beard House, I cooked chicken fried steak. Ish, yeah. yeah. I uh, I made chicken fried rabbit livers with an adobo sauce and uh, on bone marrow polenta, and once again, simple stuff. I mean, kind of elevated, yeah. but pretty simple. And if you've never eaten rabbit livers, try them. Mm-hmm. They chicken livers are pale compared to rabbit livers. What's up, um, Doc? They yeah. are <laughs> <laughs> they are mild and delicious, and I recommend them. One thing I don't recommend, if you want to use the bone marrow canoe as your serving vessel, don't try to clean them that day. I cleaned like 60 canoes that day, and that just sucked up all my extra time. The dish I was making wasn't that complicated. You know, bone marrow polenta, fucking amazing. Do it. That's easy to make. You know, chicken fried rabbit livers. Not not complicated. The, the adobo sauce, yeah, you know, dehydrated yeah. some chilies make a nice sauce. Um, but cleaning sixty bone marrow bones, no. There's a picture of me somewhere doing it. I have this expression on my face that some women might think of as sexy. I think of as pissed off because uh, <laughs> I just all the other chefs are going out and they're having lunch and doing yeah. something. Just dirt, steel wool scrubbing these, and they sucked anyway. <laughs> Put them on there. They just kind of rocked on the plate. <laughs> a little blob of polenta to kind of hold them in place. But, you know, had I just made a nice swash of polenta and put it on there, it would have been just yeah. as pretty, easier to eat. And it was some really nice natural eating. tableware. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Sponsor um, plug. Anyway, <laughs> little helpful tips, yeah. you know, from your friend Jim here. Yeah. You know, but yes, that was an amazing experience. And how lucky am I to be able to go? How many hot dog guys get to cook at the Beard House? I don't think there's more than a handful. We we have a lot in the works right now. I mean, aside from our retail program, so we're in. Uh, you know, you can find biker gyms. Uh, oh, 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 look what oh, look what here. Yeah. You know, um, you know, you can find some of our products at, at Safeway right now. You know, you find our elk and our buffalo and uh, a Louisiana red hot and uh, this really cool brat, uh, craft beer brat that we're doing. Um, some great. Great products. Mm-hmm. Grill them up at home. They're fun. They're good. They're accessible. They're good. Um, you know, they're hiding out in your gourmet hot dog session at Safeway. Um, we'll be venturing into other retail places very soon as well. Mm-hmm. We just opened up at Dick's uh, Sporting Arena, so home of the Rapids. Okay. Um, we've got a, you know, there's a game coming up shortly. Yeah. So fun. Oh, man. You know, I mean, I didn't know just what rabbit fans, soccer fans were. Mm-hmm. These guys are nuts. And it is, it's a blast to watch. And where we're located, just such a great view of the game if I ever get to pull my head up off of a grill and take a look. Um, but we're out there, we're at Ball Arena. Um, okay. We are going to be opening up in Windsor in the next six months, uh, doing both the restaurant and then just a lot of uh, street cart stuff, you know, the mobile food stuff up there. Um, that's part of it. Mm-hmm. You know, the cookbook, I think, is going to be super fun. Just you give me an, a, an opportunity to branch out a little bit like I said, and get that, that inner writer working. Yeah. You know, I can write. And I, I basically have traded my, uh, you know, my college education for writing emotionally manipulative Facebook posts. <laughs> so it would be nice to actually do something other than that. I was going to say, it comes in useful with those Yelp reviews, huh? <laughs> I did. I, I said, you know, the more responsibility I had for people in the business, 
kind of the less freedom I had <laughs> to operate in such a way that, you know, I really would want to. One on one, come on, bring it. You it's know? like Hamlet just insulting people without them realizing. Mm. You know? Beauty. Mm. The backhanded compliment. The dog hamlet. <laughs> the dog hamlet. Making shirts. So I, I just buff my knuckles. <laughs> they, they feel good. Ow. That was smooth. Ow, that was smooth. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll work on that. Yeah. I wasn't going to say anything about your shirt, but you know. Yeah. <laughs> Looks good on you, though. Appreciate it. <laughs> hey, so, so, one thing we do here. Uh, um, at our studio is like, hey, we kind of make a wish, right? You love the scene so much, we'd love to recreate the scene with you in it. How's that sound? I'm all in, man. All you know, right. I will get some. So I have made the perfect burger before, mm. you know, and get a little brisket, get a little chuck, you know, and maybe some pork shoulder, mm -hmm. grind it all together. Uh, as they state in the movie, American cheese is the best cheese for a cheeseburger. You know, it melts perfectly. So, yeah. No one likes cheese like the Americans, so you what? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know there. what's in that stuff. Is it even cheese? But, but it's you know, American. We're, but it's American. Um, but, yeah, I would love right. to make that hamburger and feed you guys and just, you know, I want to I wanna do this case for case. I want you to eat the whole thing, too. I don't want you to take a bite and have me, you know, Put it to go, you know, right away because you're full, uh, and it's time to get out of the restaurant before dessert is served or made. <laughs> ah, yes. Spoiler! Spoiler alert! Uh, dessert, dessert is dessert is my favorite yeah. thing. Yeah. You know, I mean, I love the afters. I agree, I agree. and I do well on desserts. Like you said, cheesecake. Cheesecake's just a start, and I have, I think, I have mastered and evolved the cheesecake game somewhat. So, you know, yeah, I can make beautiful New York style cheesecake, you know, um, vanilla crust. You've got, you know, just that right hint of citrus, the, you know, lemon and orange peels throughout, a little dry on the edges, a little creamier on the inside. You know, I can do that. Um, I got known for doing interesting boozy cheesecakes, so, you know, a limoncello sour orange cheesecake, Irish car bomb cheesecakes. Um, you know, just uh, Jaeger bomb cheesecakes. Which one? Jaeger bombs. That sounds gross. <laughs> gross. Oh, get off of my new show. I'm taking over the show now. Thanks for coming and joining me this week, but a Jaeger bomb cheesecake? Okay. All right. Yeah, I'm full of bad ideas. That's all. Yeah. yeah. So you and your Autobahn <laughs> fried chicken? Yeah. What kind of fried chicken? Autobahn. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, manifold fried chicken is the best, man. We're going to be doing some stuff on my bike. Hot tub, hot, hot pot. <laughs> yeah, hot tub, hot pot. That's our, that's our big one. Only if you got Kramer, yep, you know, yep. in there <laughs> watching the vegetables. Um, yeah, I did. I, although, I'm doing this one cheesecake on Cajun. Yeah, special request. Mm -hmm. Brownie bottom, brownie center, brownie top. The bottom layer is a Kahlua mocha. The top layer is amaretto white chocolate. Mm. And with that combination, yeah, it, I mean, it's just, it, it, nobody's making cheesecakes like that. Mm. It's fantastic. Hey, honey, I'm back on the wagon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't drink. I haven't drank in more than four decades, but I'll eat the shit out of that stuff. <laughs> well, let's do it. Let's recreate the scene. Um, I'm uh, yeah, very excited to do this.